So the presentation is called FileMaker, VP Forms, and Claris Connect. And I'll tell you a little bit more on why it's called that. Um, one of my customers has more than 80 different web forms where data comes from different sources uh, to be connected into FileMaker. And most often when we do our web forms, we use PHP, we use the old CWP, or we use the data API. But in many cases, the customers want to be able to create their own web forms, and uh, quite a lot of them, and, and then just continue to add more, add changes and do things by themselves. This will save not only them a lot of time and money, but also you will save a lot of time. You don't have to do all that work on an e easy night or an, a weekend where, where they need stuff to be done before the Monday release or whatever it might be. So uh, my name is Yuan Yedman. I work at the company in Sweden called Premium Systems, where we are around, I think we're 12, 13 people right now. Uh, and then whenever I don't work, I like to be out in a nature like this, where I can kind of experience the nature and just enjoy the silence. And of course, I'm a FileMaker Pro like all of you are, so nothing new with that one. So we will look into how we performs works. And we will look into how we can make Clarity Connect being the middleman, and then how we manage data that comes into FileMaker so that it's uh, usable for the users. First off, any of you ever played around with BP Forms before? None? Um, cool. Uh, have you ever, ever done any other uh, like tutorial web forms equal to VP forms where you do your web forms that it looks like you are doing it in FileMaker with layouts? No? Okay, cool. No, then, then, so. then, then this will be quite fun then. Uh, uh, I, I looked up uh, uh, some of the great credentials that VP forms have. And then one of these guys, David Hansel here wrote that as a business owner, time is most available as asset. VP forms allow me to create smart online forms with just a few clicks. With a pre-built form template and the drag and drop builder, I can create a new form that works less than two minutes without writing any single line of code. Well worth the investment. This could have been FileMaker. We could have said, write this in FileMaker Web Direct and you can have it up and running in two seconds. But probably more than two seconds or two minutes in this day because we need to put the file on the server. We, we need to add some security and other things. In this case, you can add a web form within two minutes. That's how simple it is. Question you want. Yes. Uh, have you compared like the top five and uh, seen that WP Forms is the best for premium systems or? Uh, I tried, I can't say I've tried all of them. Uh, I, I, I've been looking through quite a few of them and they all have ups and downs. Uh, reason for me choosing VP Forms, and I'll get to that in, in a short time, okay. is that it is a, just a plugin to, v, to uh, WordPress. And their entire web, web page is built out of WordPress, so then they can do everything themselves. They don't need to log in somewhere else to, to add or change or do anything. They can do that within one place. So they have their own homepage, they have all the web forms, they can add links, they can take away links and all of that on one place. And I think that is probably the crucial and most important thing why I choose to go that way. Yeah, and um, you know, talking about low code, this is something, you know, in the US people have lots of meetups for WordPress. It's very, it's there, there's a lot of information that they can do it theirself, right, Johan? Exactly. Yeah. I'll, I'll show that in a bit. I'll, I've created a little Sorry. bit of video here. Sorry. To show it looks <laughs> uh, but WordPress is a plugin, uh, and it's it's more or less uh, for free. It's, it's it's very very cheap. I, I can't remember how much it is, but it's it's very little. It's like an app that you pay for your phone more or less. And after you install that, you need to activate it, and that's like any other WordPress uh, plugin that you have. You need to activate the plugin. That's probably the most support I get from users using WordPress that they install plugins or features, but they forgot to activate that feature. So if you ever work with WordPress, make sure you always activate the feature that you have added to your homepage. Then they have a tons of templates that you can use straight off, some such as simple contact forms, 
building our order forms, newsletter signups, suggestion forms, and a lot more. And it can look something like this. So uh, you enter a name of uh, the web form that you want to use. Then you select what kind of web form that you want to use. And in this case, I'll choose quite a simple web form. And then you will get a, a template of what that looks like with your name at the top and a few things added at the start. Then you can just choose the different fields that you want to add. So if I want to add in a new single text field, I just drag and drop like we do in FileMaker. You can also simply change the label. You can have a description and you can also set it as mandatory using the, the required. You can have all different kinds of things. So you can use a drop down where you can get some uh, examples on how that looks. So you can have choices where it could be pre um, chosen and then you can change the values, super simple, just add whatever you want into it. You can add new ones and you can delete the ones as well. So it's very easy for you to add and create the value list like we do in FileMaker. Uh, we have also, we have checkboxes and you can choose one or more. You can also have the um, sliders. So the values will go up and down depending on how you choose it. You can even set it to be in between certain values or you can have it started at a certain number. And as you can see here, we can also have multiple choices, we can have numbers, emails, and, and CAPTCHA to use to make sure that the user actually are posting data, not just pretending to post data from a robot somewhere. So these are just the standard fields, but then of course there's also fancy fields. And if we look at an example here, we can see we have certain fancy fields for different types. So like phone address for adding a URL, passwords, uh, hitting fields, ratings such as, and also payment fields where you can do single items, checkbox items, drop type items, multiple items, and totals. So you can more or less add your own web shop in a simple web shop. So you, you choose what kind of articles they can choose from and they, they can add one or more items and then you will give them the total. This is just drag and dot. So it's very easy and it's very customizable for, for you for whatever uh, purpose you have for your web form. So once you build that web form, uh, you probably want your data to go somewhere. And the standard setup is that it's gonna go as an email to the email that you set up the web form to be posted to. And you can have a CC and you can have a BCC as well. So it can go to several email addresses if that's just what you want it to be. But we want our data to be stored in FileMaker and that's probably where you want it to end up as well. So in this case, I will be using Clarice Connect being the middleman, but there are many other ways. Like tomorrow there's a session about Node where that could be a web service. You can have different kinds of web service, but since we are on a FileMaker conference, I've chose to pick a uh, Clarice product called Clarice Connect. And then they have a bunch of pre-made uh, connection or connectors, as they say, like the ones you see on the right here for DocuSign or Pipedrive box and such as. But it could also be a webhook. So if it's a webhook in the settings of uh, VP forms, you just go into settings for that specific form and you enter, uh, change it to being a webhook to be on. And then you add a request URL you need to set the request method to be post, meaning you will post data to the source and then needs to be in JSON. After that, you also need to add a secret that you will get from Claris Connect. Then uh, you can have headers, but in most cases, uh, you don't really need headers. What you need are the bodies. And then you can set your own labels. And what you see here are four labels. There's three of them that's gonna be picked by different fields that I have in my web form. And then there is one that is static where I set my web form type. So here is one of those three where I've chosen one of the fields that exist in the web form, which is the email. So then uh, the value of email is gonna be part of the body. And you have all the fields here on the right side. So those are the names that you choose yourself so that you can handle the things going forward. And then the names in the body is going to be the JSON that you push, push going into Clarice Connect. Um, the web for this one uh, is always going to be looking like this. So 
it's always going to start with HTTPS and then a long, long line of things until it says we won. And then it's going to be your name catch. The combination of your name and the secret ID is going to be the key of transporting data from the webhook into Claris Connect. Uh, and it's generated as a hash. And that means after that, it will be going uh, securely over to uh, Claris Connect with a secret um, and, and then provided as a request header. So let me show you how that works then. So Claris Connect can be many things and one of them is the webhook. So in, on the left side of the Claris Connector, you have the different things. You have flows, approvals, webhooks, and sharing. And, and then the, the ones we usually talk about are flows, where you build different steps that will do things for you. Transform data, adding things on different connectors, such as. But we can also add a webhook. And then you create a webhook with a name. And you see here again, here is the name that it's going to become. And then you set it to be uh, here. I got two ones. One is called VP Forms Staging and VP Forms Production. So then that's that was going to be the same name as I saw in the URL over here. So if we look at um, how we can demonstrate this one, so I built a flow, whereas the data is going to come from the webhook into Claris Connect. I'm going to create a record in FileMaker, and then I'm going to run a script in FileMaker to post that data in a way that I want the data to look and, uh, and work like. So in my flows, I have two right now, one for staging as a development, and also one for production. And the incoming HTTP request at the top here is going to be the first one happening, being the webhook. So then I just choose the name of the webhook, which I'll be using. And you choose out of the one that exists for this web page. And then you can see here is what it's going to look and work like. Then there is the create record, which is one of the connectors for FileMaker, where you select at the account and configure. You choose a layout. And they say, I want to put the data into this field, where it's from the body of the different types. So body, web form times should be into the type field. And the webhook JSON should have the full body of everything else. Then. I do the last part where it's an execute script where I choose from what layout and what the script name is going to be. And then what is the data that I'm going to transfer? And in this case, it's the respond from step two where I, it holds the ID of the record. So the re record that was created in step two is going to give me a respond back that I can put into step two here. When I run this part, what's going to happen is that, oh, wrong way. Uh, it will create the data using the data API. So it means you need to have a privilege set that's allowing you to access through FileMaker Data API. And that is the one below on the left side here called the access via FileMaker API API. You don't need anything else. You need to have records being created in only the table that you want for and nothing else. So you can really set this one to just do the things that you want. So access only the layers that you want, scripts that you will allow it to run, only the one that you want it to run, uh, value list, you only view only, and records, only the records where you wanted it to put record. And then nothing else need to be enabled there. Then the script that I want to run, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna go through three simple slides here and, and see what is happening. I'm getting the ID from step two, which is create, creation of the record. Then I'm just adding that as a parameter into the third step where I run that script with a script parameter. So I go into find mode, I go to the right layout, I set the field with a parameter and I do it fine. The response that I get back is the ID of the record that I want to do something with. And what I want to do is I want to parse JSON into fields. So I'm adding uh, the parameter into the parameter right here that I get from this record. Out of that, then I just I have a, a normal JSON get element to get the different values that was posted through the web form. And depending on web form, it's doing different things. So you can control it in any normal way you do in FileMaker. When you have that, 
So you have a web form. And in this case, I think we are on 87 different web forms right now. All of them are pushing data into FileMaker Daily. You want to make sure that the data that comes in doesn't just go straight into your FileMaker solution. So web forms post data to your webhooks. The webhook being Claris Connect transfer your data to a table that I call the passage. The passage holds data. And if it is correct and I have all the, have all the mandatory data that I can expect, then it transfer data into the solution. So I have a passage that controls data so we don't end up having web forms that's being controlled by a robot in, in Russia, just posting things abnormally into the solution. So whenever data is correct, I create things in the solution. And there could be one or, or many things that is created. It could be a customer. It could be a new order. It could be order rows. It could be order rows and sending it out to uh, the technician who's going to do the order or such as. Uh, so for me, uh, the passage is, is very important to make sure that the data that I get into FileMaker is never uh, always going to be OK. Therefore, it can exist outside of the solution. OK, that was everything going through in a super rapid speed as usual for me. Um, going from web forms through the webhook being Keras Connect into FileMaker. Questions on that? Hi, Johan. Very good uh, explanation. How are uh, attachments um, uploaded? Is that then in Base64 that you, you do that? Or you can directly um, push uh, a file to via the API then, I, I guess? or so Data API takes Base64 files. So then we can yeah. easily transfer the data as such. But I, will, I, will, uh, I always, when I add a field, like uh, to add a field, a file, I always have uh, set so that the files are up to a certain size mm -hmm. because you don't want them to post an entire hard drive or something like that. Uh, but it's, it's, it's uh, absolutely doable of adding in files without any problems. Yeah, OK. Um, Johan, you told us um, you do uh, your data verification in um, in the passage table, uh, when you fill in and uh, transfer to your solution, uh, can there be um, a first verification on the VP form? Uh, yes. So uh, you, you can always uh, add the CAPTCHA moment to make sure and add mandatory fields. So if we go back a bit here uh, and stop. Uh, here. So let's say, uh, so in this one, uh, let's post a little bit further. Uh, let's see, one big post. There we go, a little bit further. There you go. So once you click on edit on that one, you see required here on the left side, which means oh. then that there will be mandatory fields. Uh, so you can choose yourself which fields are mandatory and who's, who's not. But it's only about uh, required or not, not being required and not about. You can um, add field options. I, so you can go into advanced options here and conditional options. So you can set for each one of these ones being on certain types. So in the advanced ones, you can have um, certain types of ones. So if, if we, for example, want them to add an email address, it will automatically check that it's a correct, correct email address. OK, great. It handles uh, phone numbers as well. Uh, but phone numbers aren't really corrected uh, throughout the world in the same format. So Jan, in Belgium, he has one format. In Germany, okay, you have another one. In Sweden, we have a third one. And so it's never going to be the same. So it's going to be really hard to keep track of all the different formats. Anyone have something yeah. uh, similar to VP forms? Yeah, I've done something with Zoho forms. Um, works very much the same way. Um, it's my first use of webhooks with Claris Connect. Yeah. Um, as a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. It works works really well. I'm doing the same sort of thing, coming into a table, making sure the data is valid, 
then processing the form out. Um, yeah, Zoho forms my client like because they what they're doing a lot of evaluation forms for um, younger and emotionally issued, uh, emotionally challenged people, and so some images help more than words. And um, yeah, with, yeah. with Zoho forms, you can upload images for choices rather than text. Okay, good. Which is quite smart, and it's quite cheap as well compared to form stack or woohoo or whatever. Yeah. The, the only limitation I say so far is uh, if your customer doesn't have a, a Claris Connect developer license on Claris Connect and you have many web forms, <clears throat> it becomes quite a lot of records. And yes. And the flows are running like daily. I don't know how many, but it's several hundreds a day. So it quite it spins up quite fast. And you have a certain number of flows you can run per year. And if you see that number, it become quite expensive to use Claris Connect. Yeah, that, that's not an issue for this client. They're doing only maybe maybe a thousand a year, so it's not a problem. Okay, good, good. How was your um, uh, way into Claris Connect? Uh, have you been on the ETS or was it uh, possible for you to uh, get into Claris Connect later as a normal FileMaker developer? Uh, can you describe a bit how you uh, took up the, uh, the tool and uh, made some interesting stuff out of it? So if I was in the ETS, I was probably not allowed to tell you, but uh, yes, I was. Uh, <laughs> uh, they, I would say that uh, they enhance the way we build flows quite a lot, uh, going from the version we had in DTS to the one that was presented for public. And in some connectors, it, it doesn't really make sense on what you need to do. You need to find things in the forums, but for some, they're really straightforward. Like for example, I beat quite a few of those um, when you want to add newsletters and things, send emails out to customers, then it's super easy. I've done one for Dropbox and that's also very, very easy. Um, I haven't tested them all. We, I tried to do it towards um, Microsoft to have them adding stuff to the calendar. And I, I find it easier to do it the old way to the Microsoft Graph API that uh, Jan teached me a little about a few years ago. Uh, so I think that's probably easier than going through Claris Connect. Your, Jan, have you tried that? Uh, I was too early and we did not figure out anything and left it at the side. So the node red uh, presentation comes in after you. So it's a bit other way. Uh, my question would be, was it a business decision for you or technical to the, uh, decision to, uh, to select Claris Connect as, as an intermediate service? Uh, I think I wanted to see uh, if I could uh, make Claris Connect work with such heavy traffic. So I wanted to test it out a little bit. So that's one of the reasons. I, we could easily build a, a web service through other th uh, types of programming such as dot, uh, dot .NET or, or equal. But uh, we decided to go this way this time. Uh, I'm not sure I'm gonna do that same another time. But most important thing here is that we don't need to do anything going forward because there's just one way handling everything. And they can add as many web forms here as they want. They just need to add that same URL and shared key in their webhooks. Yes, the web hub, uh, approach looks very promising in that way. There, there are unlimited uh, types of microservices uh, that you have on AWS and Azure and Equal, where you can do, I'd say you could probably do, do uh, simpler things much faster than doing it in Claris Connect. Well, we are in the Claris, Connect, uh, the Claris family, so we should hold hand and at least try to get them that product going forward as well. I can tell you, you one just a short uh, experience I had with uh, Jotform. Have you heard of Jotform? I haven't tried it. I read about it. Yeah, so it's a great article written. I think it's one and a half or two years ago uh, from uh, Codens about uh, integrating Jotform uh, forms with uh, their API to FileMaker, and it's written by uh, what's the name of the guy at Codas, but just uh, Google uh, FileMaker Jotform and you get that at the top. Uh, 
And that was an uh, experience uh, very nice. I think it was uh, three hours before uh, with starting re reading the article uh, until the, the, the customer had the, their solution. So it was really a fast uh, implementation of that. And uh, if you have a small amount of forms, then it's uh, no cost at all uh, mm -hmm. to set it up. But uh, of course, I've seen all these different kinds of form uh, uh, development tools or uh, companies, and they, they, they are benefits and drawbacks uh, for everyone. Yeah, that, that's very true. I, a lot of them, like you said, they have like, you can have five web forms for free, but as soon as you have the sixth or the tenth or such, uh, it starts costing you money. Mm -hmm. And then there is in the small line of the, of the agreements, it says once you start adding up a number of uh, submitted requests, it's gonna start costing you money as well. Yeah. So some, sometimes you need to read that as well. Yeah, so. that, that's true. Uh, I don't remember the, but maybe it was in this case, three forms or, or and uh, like 50 uh, um, data set per, per month or something like that. I don't remember, Perfect. but it's, it's some limit. Yeah. yeah it's, I mean, you do need to be careful about security of these kind of WordPress plugins and any web forms too, because I know WordPress has had several issues with plugins. So just making sure they their web person keeps them updated. Yes, very true. Yeah. WordPress seems to be almost like Windows that they send out updates quite often. Uh, not sure what the updates are about uh, all the time. Yeah, but you just do them, right? <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> yes, do and then hope for the best. <laughs> Very true. Uh, just another question about your solution. Um, how you do you use the passage uh, file? Is it for one solution or for, for is it kind of multi-tenant uh, gateway for for different solutions you can set up for different clients? I, I could have used one for all of them and sending things to different uh, servers using the data API, but I've used to create. Uh, I have a, a like a a template passage uh, table that I use. Uh, that holds like the most usual uh, things you need from the web form that I post into the solutions that I need. And it also, also have a card layout and a list layout. Uh, but then it's always going to be up to the client what different things are required for their solution. So if it's an order uh, service uh, template where they ask for new things, or if it's just adding up for new, new, new customers or new newsletters, you need different things. But you need to make sure that the whole solution is actually, um, I think that's the most important thing that you have, uh, I'm gonna go all the way, go. That you have this wall here, that you don't let anything through, that you don't know that the data is correct. So you are the one responsible for the data that goes into your solution not anyone else, or absolutely not anyone from the outside that's posting data into your solution. Great presentation, Johan, thank you. Uh, You're welcome, thank you. I just want to share my experience. Uh, I, I have used uh, WP Forms and Zolt Form, and uh, pretty much they are the same. And for low budget clients, uh, I have been using Rapid Weaver, which is a low code uh, web development for Mac for a lot of years. And they have a, a W, a, they have a form plugin that you can create forms without a backend. Oh. And uh, yeah, I, I, I found this very uh, interesting and this is why I'm mentioning. So you don't need a backend, you don't need WordPress, you just need the, the middleman, Claris Connect or whatever. Yeah. It's so, very interesting. If anyone needs more info about uh, making uh, uh, without backend forms, uh, just ping me. Why don't you set up a session tomorrow or later today or maybe on Saturday? Can you show us? Yeah, there's time on Saturday. Yeah. Please. Okay, please great. 
Great, but I, I will be showcasing with uh, with Integro, but not Claris Connect. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. I think we all are experts on this part. And I think we know what we can do with the different forms getting the data into a solution. But this webhook or the web service that we hold here, and many places, uh, not all of us are web developers, so we know how to build that one. So if we instead can use an equal part like Claris Connect, where we can just click on things to make things happen, that's going to make things so much easier for us. So I'd say that in some way, Claris Connect here makes sense for us to do, since we are, we are a, a low-code developer, so to speak, where we just click and drag. And this Claris Connect makes sense to us. Yeah. Have you, have you done anything with presentation of data that sort of comparison of evaluation forms or anything like that? Or has it been form submission for personal details and things? Uh, so those 87 forms that exist right now are all different kind of kinds, like mm -hmm. all, right? really all. So uh, I, the first ones, I helped the customer client to get started so that they got a, a feeling of what they could do and, and how they can work with them. And then they just kicked off. So now they have web forms for everything. Uh, and then they send them off to new clients or to groups of clients or whatever to get information about the clients or their clients and, and such as. So all data that now comes in, I just kind of move them in the right direction into different parts of the solution, depending on what web form there is. And they, but they, if they send it off to a new client to make a change to it, they must tell you which field the information has to go into and you update it, or do you have got a method for them to do that? And so uh, up above the passage here, I have, uh, if I'll make a table that I call the web API, settings and that says if it's coming from this specific web type then i'll do this with the data going to the different fields right and okay. then i transfer that data depending on what web form there is to different parts sometimes to many different parts but most of the time to one or two things yeah yeah so every, every time you have to create a new you have to create the trans translation table effectively uh yeah, if, if it's something tricky, if it's just creation of uh, an order and service, they just need to add one specific uh, web type. But if it's something brand new, they need to tell me, and yeah. then I just fix that part. Yeah. So that the transfer through the wall here is, is quite a little, lot of different things. Yeah. But I am in short, so nothing gets through if I don't control it. Yes. Uh -huh. I remember way a, back when we had uh, IWP and we did this, uh, we all did this nice web forms and then they turned out being web direct and we thought we could get data out from the outside into FileMaker and they will work perfectly. And then out of the blue, you had a lot of data coming from India and then you couldn't understand why it came and how that URL that you created for your client can end up in India. And then it started going from Pakistan and then from Australia. And then you had records in your database that holds all kinds of stuff that you didn't want to have there. So I learned my way to the, to the journey that I need a passage to hold the data first before I do anything else. It's like your, wait, it's like your Zoom waiting room and mute, <laughs> bu and mute button. <laughs> Very true, yeah. Heidi, how do you do when you do things like this? I would always say it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's probably the case. It kind of depends on uh, clients and such. But if you only have one or two forms, it, it, or you'll have different ways of handling things and you can probably get more data straight into FileMaker. Mm -hmm. But as soon as start, things start leveling up, then it's a whole, whole different thing. I've had to, on mine, because of the various different data types in the form, and it's not necessarily recording names and addresses or form data, it's evaluation form and feedback. It actually takes a label from the, the field on the form and creates a new record for that for each form. So I get the, the question and the answer. Okay. And then I can do comparisons of forms down yeah. the line, which so, is messy, but it works. Yeah. So. 
when you get data in from JSON, you can do whatever you want. You can yeah. create records, related records, exactly what you want or what you need. It's just yeah. totally up to you. So you can have hundreds of things coming through your JSON, and then you just choose the elements that you want. Yeah. And you can you can get data and transfer data in the, into a format that you think is needed. So it's quite easy. As you can see here, I post data into one table called the passage for records and IDs and things. But I also, in here, I uh, format the data so it looks in the way that I wanted it to look. And here you see, depending on where it goes from, it goes and also connect the data from a, a related table they call the API settings. Yeah. Did you have to look at codings or is it uh, something uh, Claris Connect handles for you? Uh, can you expect proper data to be transported through your pipeline with always UTF-8 without any uh, corrupt uh, ASCII codes or whatever? Uh, did you experience anything in this, in this kind of matter or is it all behind the wall of Claris Connect that you always get proper data without having to filter it yourself? So uh, within Claris Connect, when you uh, add anything and you, you get post or whatever you do, there's always going to be a result. And in most cases, no matter what connectors you choose, it's going to be a JSON code. That JSON code looks exactly like the way it was posted into the Claris Connect. So in the first step that I had, uh, I had um, the webhook. So the data that is uh, going from the web form is always going to be post and then it's going to be JSON data. Those two is the things that's going to be posted into uh, um, the webhook here. What I then do is then I take that data that comes in and I create the record uh, in the first step that I did here, a file mix step, create record. And I just post that, uh, meaning creation of a new record post data into two fields that I selected myself out of the body JSON. And then thirdly, out of the response of that creation of the record, the response I get back is the ID of that newly created record. So then when I run the third step, which is creation, uh, running this FileMaker script, I just add that parameter from the second step, which was the record ID, so that I run the script based upon that one. So when I do the first thing here, I just pass along the parameter of the record ID, and then I search for it. So that means this is the record that I want to work on, and I want to parse the JSON, so I just parse the JSON. Yes, so, that seems clear. What, what happens if uh, someone is able to put in, uh, a zero character into your uh, web form or something like this? Uh, would it be transferred to the FileMaker field in the end result, or is it parsed out? somewhere in between, uh, as you showed. So if we go back, I'm going back and forward all the time. Here, here you go. So here in the web form where you select the webhook you want to go uh, and you added your URL in the secret, you choose what fields that you want to transfer. And it's going to hold the, this is going to be the label for the JSON. So it's going to say email, web form, customer uh, last name and customer first name. And then you choose the fields that you want to populate. And it's going to hold all the characters that they added. So if they use a, a German uh, U with a two dots on or a double S, it's going to hold those. So it's not going to be a problem getting that information into to Claris Connect. Yes, the problems typically occur if there are invalid characters that has not a uh, visible sense, but um, some kind of carriage return, zero characters, or that stops the data transmission in some interfaces. So if people uh, drag in something from, from Word or uh, any other platform, sometimes you have invisible codings between the characters. And this invisible codings could break your workflow later on if you will get the data and expect something to happen with it. And uh, so if there is, is a question to you is, have you done any further filtering to prevent from that invalid characters to get into your workflow? So I, uh, I think that I could probably add any kind of data into my text field. So the type is it's just text. I can probably add anything that I want, which means that I could probably add a JavaScript that could run somewhere if it, it goes into the wrong hands. I haven't yes. tested that. 
to give mm. to give you an example, uh, um, uh, we a supply a web shop solution where people give in their address uh, to where the shipment should go, and the shipment software at the end of the line uh, uh, just crashes if there is a special uh, zero character in it, and we have to call the uh, the software provider of the uh, um, of the fulfilling provider to uh, to get the solution back on track uh, because some invalid characters uh, went from the shop to our interface to FileMaker, from FileMaker back to another interface and from that other interface into the shipping software. And the shipping software got finally a problem because the customer was able to put in some invalid characters in the web form. And so I think it would be a good idea to have some kind of in your passage uh, step or anywhere, a kind of filter for, for valid uh, UTF or ASCII characters that are typically allowed to transfer some visible data. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Why I have the passage. So I will control any data that leaves this one being in a, a, such a great correct state as possible before it gets into the solution. Yeah, I have custom yes, functions. Yes. I generally put that through any text yeah. I put in a field. I want to make sure it hasn't got any characters. I just use a custom function to filter it out. Yeah, it would be good. Good way. Yeah. So you're doing all your validation and passage as well. Every, every all the data that comes in is is kind of checked if it before it goes through, so it's somehow valid. Uh, I wouldn't check if it holds a thousand lines of uh, JavaScript, but then it wouldn't make sense to have that in zip code because it will usually hold like five or six digits. Mm -hmm. So then I can check for length or, or equal. So there's, it's quite easy to check for some of the fields, but for not for all, because if there's a description of the work that needs to be done, they need to be able to write stuff that's going to be happening in the order. And there may be, may be sample types that look like code that they're putting in as part of what they're doing. Yeah. Can you have uh, data back that you, you can use back? that you can use for uh, a second web form? Yeah, okay, so yeah, I have some uh, custom web forms which are built uh, with dot, .NET, where they transfer uh, their personal number, and in Sweden we have data sources where we then ask for the address. So. We post the data into Passage, create a record with a personal number, and then we check to a credit solution for the address. We then post that data back to the web form so that they get all their uh, addressing correctly to the web form. So you don't have to enter it manually. And then they just choose the articles that they want to pick, and then they submit. And then all the, those articles is posted to that existing record. So in that way, we control the data that they are supposed to fill in. Yeah, okay. And also data from your uh, FileMaker database? So like, they will never- uh, Time talk. slots or something? So on top of this, you can, uh, uh, what I usually do is I add a, a file that I call uh, the solution underscore API. That file holds a certain amount of solutions uh, that you can call either layouts or what I usually do is I, I give them a script that, uh, where I control the way that they call. So they always add a certain amount of parameters so that I know that they are an existing client or customer or whatever it might be. And then the response that comes back is JSON and then they can do whatever they want with it. Okay. So I never, uh, that, API could be going towards the passage or parts of your solution. But I always hold that in a separate file. So all the API file is doing is just handling the, the calls that comes from the outside. Okay, that's a middle file. Yeah, you can say though, it doesn't have any tables. It just holds uh, TOs from different other as, uh, files. Yeah. And what I usually do when I'm working is that I have one data file or a set of data files, and then I have one UI file where I do all the work, where both of these uh, uh, solution or these parts of the solution are, but this one is kind of isolated within. I saw that uh, Marcel wrote about uh, Honsa and uh, 
the 24 UI, they uh, have a software for webhook that is uh, you can also use. But there are many different other things you can use for webhooks. So uh, you you can you can just search for webhooks, and then you will have a full day of uh, going through the different webhooks that are available right now. And Wem's session last year was good too. At yes, Claire's engaged. Exactly. The good thing of the Honza solution is they do the uh, session handling for you to the FileMaker data API. So you don't have to um, recreate a session key every time you make a call. They, they have a kind of um, cache where uh, the session uh, lasts for 15 minutes and renews itself. And there's logging and error uh, debugging everything in it. So you just have a clean interface with some uh, sample entry points uh, to call the FM Restore and is uh, available in two flavors as a JavaScript or as PHP. So if you have a PHP solution on your web server and you have a secure line from your PHP solution to your FileMaker server, then uh, it, it could be also a good way to um, address the data API. And if you do this with webhooks or in the direct way, uh, um, there are more possible ways to do it. Uh, you're not uh, the webhook is only one way to use the FM Restore. It is a, a general interface for data API. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of it, but we still have a problem with uh, the memory loss of FileMaker server that is causing um, data API and CWP connections to not disable like it should. And, and the more sessions you have towards the server, um, the more it's going to be hooked on and, and never be released. So it's going to end up you having quite a lot of them. And that's going to cause your servers to keep a lot of uh, temp uh, place for those connections. Um, the only way for me to handle that one is that I built a separate file that is calling the admin API to search for connected uh, data API or CWP connectors that's been online for more than a certain amount of minutes or hours, you can set it up yourself. And if so, disconnect them. Because you cannot connect them from the admin console. The only way you can disconnect them is by going through the CLI or going through the admin API. Um, we had a session. Uh, so you know, have this also here as part of your setup. Exactly, yeah. And we, I, we had a, uh, there was a uh, talk about this uh, with a Clarice meeting a few, few months back where a guy had a lot of web direct sessions. He had multiple working machines. And in some reasons, one of the users wouldn't disconnect. And the only way to get that machine up and running was to actually disconnect that whole machine from the setup and then restart it to get rid of that connection. So that memory problem is gonna be a problem if you have many connections going through your server like throughout the entire day. So if you have a webhook like the 24 software where you, it's gonna be updating itself, that's probably a good idea to keep it on hook. But Claris Engage is also really good, or Claris Connect is also really good of keeping track of the, the same uh, session that it, it added up a few times ago. And since I have so many new records being created, the flows is running so many times, it's never a problem. Yes, good to know, thank you.